type from okay so i suppose we are live so welcome to i think the final live session i believe we may still do a courtesy meet up after the exams to kind of just discuss possibly the exam questions i don't know exactly how that works but um, but yeah i believe uh, we are on uh, basically recap assignments now based on materials essentially based on um, randomization approximation um, and exact algorithms um, so if you had specific doubts from any of the existing assignments i'm happy to discuss those now uh, so we can begin with that i think on the forums aria you said you had some questions if anybody else has any questions we can basically begin with those otherwise my plan was to kind of do a bit of a recap and an overview of some things that we missed out on in this edition and uh, plans for how you can access that material in your course Um, and so my doubt is from the uh, week eight assignment first, which I asked on uh, discourse as well, I believe. Uh, okay. So there was a discussion on whether we should take the, uh, like P as a probabilistic, uh, not, I mean, uh, the, how should I put it? Like, it, it's like P should be taken as an estimate of the actual probability. So there was a confusion regarding that, right? So if we can just... First Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, the distinction that I was making in my comment was between, um, I think there was a question of, okay, so I don't remember which way the notation went, P less than Q versus P less than or equal to Q. Um, I think there was, so do we agree that one of the probabilities is one? Uh, okay. Uh, I've just pulled up the question. So. Uh, the correct okay. answer gave it as let Q denote. Uh, so P was basically, no, so answer, accepted answers are A and C, but I think on the forum you said that A and D would be the answer, right? There was a confusion on that mm, regard as well. Right, right. So no, I, I just want to clarify if... Um, if yeah, one of them will be one. So yeah, one yeah. of them will be one. one. Of them yeah. will so basically the idea was, okay, so the idea of the question was basically to explore this pigeonholing idea and also to confirm that when we talk about fixed arrays, what we are basically saying is that uh, this inequality should hold. So we are not assuming that the arrays are being drawn from a distribution and we are not taking any expectation over arrays. So there are two fixed arrays which are just given to you that have these properties. And in one of the arrays, the point is that the number of ones exceeds uh, sort of the number of iterations. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think let's say that you're going to ping 500 uh, random locations. Share my screen, ma'am. Like, uh, that would be. Yeah, a maybe you can share your screen because I'm trying to set up the iPad. So that's why I'm not messing around. Okay, I'll screen. share. So, yeah. we take it exactly. That would be better. Uh, I'll okay. share my screen. Uh, Ma'am, can you okay. see the question? Yeah, I can now see the question. So here, basically what we want to say is, um, okay, so I want to talk about option D, which is where I think there was some confusion. So, um, so B has at least 500 ones, uh, sorry, 700 ones. And this algorithm is going to sample without replacement 500 times, right? So, since B is guaranteed to have at least 700 ones, this algorithm is guaranteed to find the one, right? Yes. So the probability that the algorithm returns a valid index in the array B, this probability T is equal to one, right? Right. Right. So, so Q is less than or equal to P because Q is a probability value and a probability value is at most one. So in that sense, Q is at most P. And there can be arrays on which um, Q is indeed strictly less than P. Do we agree on these two statements? Yeah. Okay. So now I think the question was, I, I think at some point I said that I should have said Q is at most P in the sense that 
it's plausible that q is also equal to 1 in the sense that because c is a fixed array which is guaranteed to have at least 451s in particular it could be an all ones array or it could be an array which is exactly like b so there could be cases of b and c where these probabilities both happen to be one right so in some scenarios p equals q equals one but depending on the array c the array c could have strictly 451s and maybe just the first 450 entries are one and the last uh, 550 entries are zeros and it's possible that with some non-zero probability, the array only pings entries in the second half. And therefore, it does not return a valid index. And for such examples, Q would be strictly less than 1 and Q would be strictly less than P. But it's just that it's not going to always be the case. You can give me examples of B and P where P equals Q equals 1. So it would have been more accurate for me to say that Q is at most P. That was the last comment that I remember making in the forum. Is that clear or is that not clear? Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That is the exact point of, uh, I mean, confusion because, I mean, not confusion, okay. but that is what I thought while answering because okay. uh, your, uh, the right. way I interpreted this P greater than Q is like P is strictly greater right. than Q, which is not always right. true, right? So, yeah, which may uh, not that is why I just chose, so I... chose one option uh, instead of the D option. Correct, correct. So, yeah. yeah, so I think what I had in mind was something that is at least true, but unfortunately, I think the way the question went out or the way I typed it out was that P was greater than Q, strictly greater than Q. So that was in some sense a typo at my end, which I didn't even realize until the discussion went further, because in my mind, I was like, I just wanted to say that Q is bounded by P and P is one. That, that's all that I wanted to say. And um, indeed, if you do like the average over all possible universes of B and C, or if you say that B and C are being drawn from uniform distributions, then perhaps what you can legitimately say is that Q is less than P because you'll be averaging over all possible arrays B and C that have these properties. So for the array B, no matter what array you pick, as long as it has at least 700 ones, which is the universe, You'll always have one, so an average of ones is going to be one again, so P will be one. But Q, where you are uniformly sampling from arrays that have at least 450 ones, at least on some entries you will get a value that's strictly less than one, and the average will be less than one. So if I had not said that they are arbitrary, so uh, I think somewhere I've explicitly said that we should assume that these arrays are not generated by any random procedure. The arrays are arbitrary but fixed. Because of that, it really should have been P is at least Q. But if the arrays were, let's say, sampled from a uniform distribution over all arrays that have this property, then what is given is actually correct. Okay? Right. Ma'am, so for this, can we get the reevaluation, please? Like. Yeah, so I think I am collecting the re-evaluations. Hopefully, they should be done soon. And I'll add this in to, I don't know, maybe I can request the uh, team to confirm. I guess Aruth is online. So can we do a marks to all or whatever is the appropriate uh, thing? Because I think people can interpret this both ways in some sense. So can we have a re-evaluation on this? Okay, so I'm not completely sure if Arup's online, but I'll make sure to follow up with him after. Uh, yeah, okay, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and uh, basically this not generated by any random procedure means that it's not being generated by a, a distribution, right? From a sample from a distribution. Yeah, right? so, so we are not, yeah. exactly. So none of, none of these arrays are being sampled from, like we have no, uh, okay. So, yeah, I was going to say we have no information about the distribution, but yeah, what, what the question is asking me to consider is um, two arbit so, so basically we're saying it can be any of these arrays, and uh, in particular, because we're not sampling from a distribution, the question is not to take an average over, yeah, so if I said that it was being sampled from a uniform distribution over all arrays that have this property, then you would analyze this slightly differently. If it was a different distribution, not uniform, but maybe something else, then again, you would analyze it slightly differently. But we didn't do a lot of that kind of analysis uh, in the lectures as well. So I just wanted to keep it as a sort of a simple uh, probability uh, sort of analysis or sanity check. 
uh, but yeah, with probability problems, it's it's extra important. That, okay, it's always important to be careful with language, but I would say especially so with probability problems because I think there are lots of famous probability puzzles that traditionally people find confusing, and most of those can be traced to language and interpretation issues. So I did want to be careful, but ironically, I think the expression that I had ended up having a typo. So we will definitely flag this for the evaluation and thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. I mean, basically, let's say even if you were drawing from a distribution, then basically this P and Q would be like estimators of the actual, like, I mean, the probabilities themselves, right? So something like P, P be, tilde and Q right. tilde, because they are right. estimators themselves, they, right? So correct. they would be estimators, yeah. but with this uh, option D, because the universe is kind of very special, for B, it's the universe of all arrays which have at least 700 ones. Then in each of those elements of the sample space or the universe, you're always going to, uh, you know, your your experiment is always going to succeed. So even the estimator would have a value of one. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah, for yes. C, the estimator would not have a value of one because that there, there's some support that is lost. There would be some, no, I mean, the probability would be very small, but you would still have scenarios where uh, the experiment would fail. So the estimator for Q would be, would not have a value of one. So you would have a P greater than Q situation, but that's not what the question is asking. So I think we have, we have, I mean, you would yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have some doubts from assignment nine as well. I mean, quite a few basically. So should I just okay. go ahead or right. should I wait? Yeah, yeah, we can work through them. But if you're saying that uh, you have a number of them, I don't know if, um, okay. So and no, I mean, that I think we broadly okay. like, it's Steiner tree only. Okay. Yes, ma'am. As I far as I can, uh, I've just, uh, in every question, for some reason, I've kind of marked one extra option, uh, which has led to zero marks from for okay. both of them. So if you can just uh, take okay. these two questions okay. and explain them uh, a bit, uh, because I think the notion of okay. what a Steiner tree is, is might also not be very clear to me. This is why I might have made these mistakes. So, okay, no, yeah. no, no worries. Yeah. So, I think, uh, yeah, let me just try and see. I'm, I've been trying to connect uh, over the over my screen. Uh, just give me a second to see if I can share my screen. But, okay, in any case, let's um, um, let's go. So, Sharon, did you also have doubts with these questions? And would it be okay if we just went over this line of two based questions? Or? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have yes, a doubt in question two. Uh, I just wanted to clarify what is meant by D? Like uh, the input instance is equivalent to a uh, reduced instance. Could you elaborate on that as well? Okay, I see. So I think, um, okay, so by a reduced instance, we are referring to reduced in the sense of reductions that we have talked about earlier. I think this sentence could have been worded a little more helpfully. I think somebody did ask this on the forums, and uh, my response was that it's possible to convert this instance, the input instance, into another one, which is equivalent in the sense of yes, instances are preserved, no instances are preserved. But this new instance that we generate has this additional property that the terminal vertices have to be exactly one. That is um, okay. So I can I can try to demonstrate uh, such a reduction, and we can try to see if um, if that makes sense. Uh, but essentially, the point was that there exists such a reduction. You can come up with such a reduction. I think that is what the option was trying to say. And um, like I said, maybe I should have put it over an announcement. But it was it, it did come up in the forum, and I did try to reply soon after the question was posted. Uh, but regardless, that's something we can we can go over in a little more detail. Uh, yes. So, Sharon, apart from that option in that question, do you have anything else? Uh, not much, ma'am. But uh, if you could just explain the Steiner tree problem, it would be a bit more clarity okay, on the screen. Sure, I think I, I will do that. And I think Manisha, at some point, you were also unmuted for a bit. So, do you have anything specific, or will you just 
supporting the need for discussing synergy. Uh, yeah, even I think I didn't understand the synergy thing. So okay, okay. All right, fair enough. I think um, I'll try I'm to go over this. Keep sharing my. Um, should I keep sharing my screen or should I just stop sharing? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, I missed what you said there. Um, uh, I, I was saying, am I audible now? Yeah, you're audible now. Yeah, I was just saying whether I should keep sharing my screen or uh, not share my screen. Oh, yeah, okay. No, maybe uh, I'm going to try and share my screen. Let me see if this, uh, this okay. works. Uh, so, yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah, it seems to be. Okay, so I, I think my device is joined, but I need to find a way of starting the broadcast at the screen. Just give me a second. Okay. So I suppose this is visible, yes? Yes, uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So let me talk about the Steiner tree problem first. Um, Steiner tree is essentially one way of thinking about it is that it's a generalization of spanning tree. So in spanning tree, your goal is to come up with, um, okay, if your edges have weights, right? Then your goal is to come up with a minimum cost way of connecting all the vertices in your graph. And that's why you don't have any cycles. A tree is an optimal structure. And if you have weights, then you're trying to minimize the sum of these weights. Now, in a Steiner tree problem, you're not trying to connect everything. You're trying to connect only a specific subset of vertices. And it turns out that this is much harder to do than spanning tree, although it seems like in spanning tree, you're trying to connect everything. Now you only have to worry about some subset. So spanning tree should be harder, perhaps. But somehow it turns out that spanning trees are easy to do. They're easy to find. And you probably remember this from your algorithms course, PIMS or cross curves algorithm. But it turns out that finding an optimal Steiner tree, depending on the subset that you're trying to connect, can be as hard as, say, vertex cover. So this is, a, this is one of these classic and complete problems. So I'm going to continue with, I think, the notation in the, um, in the assignment, if I remember correctly. So that's case some subset of vertices we call these terminals and these are the things that we are trying to connect so you have your graph g and somewhere you have the subset k and you're only worried about connecting the vertices in k as cheaply as possible so something like that you would basically highlight these edges and you would say, okay, now you're happy because you can go from any terminal to any other terminal via the tools and edges, and you don't need, um, you know, you don't need anything else. So this is, um, um, you have, okay, so I mean, uh, in this case, you, I think hopefully it was clear that we're working with an undirected graph, and um, I think we ended up with edge weights, right? So let me just maybe pull this up. Yeah, so I think we just call this function w. And you had positive real bits. That's, um, I think that was the setting. And um, you want to find, um, yeah, so, so you basically want to find the tree that has the smallest weight. So notice that it's always going to be a tree because all weights are positive. So if you have a cycle among your chosen edges, then that's going to be redundant. Um, so just as with spanning trees, the thing that the optimal object that connects your terminals 
is also always going to be a tree. You can always drop the largest weight edge from a cycle. You would still retain connectivity and you would have something cheaper. So hopefully it's clear why a Steiner tree is called a Steiner tree. Now, this exercise was, I think, meant to be a slightly challenging um, detour in combining ideas from both inclusion, exclusion as well as, so if you remember in one of the live sessions we discussed how to do Hamiltonian um, paths using inclusion exclusion, where we said we will count walks and we will try to eliminate walks that are not paths. And here we're going to do something similar, except that instead of walks, we are going to, um, well, at least uh, the solution that comes up for this using inclusion exclusion is, um, is using a concept called granting walks. But anyway, um, I think we don't, um, you know, we, we don't really get into branching works necessarily um, when we are dealing with the assignment questions. So let me just go through the uh, sort of go through the options one by one here. So uh, first of all, okay, so the first question says that um, all the vertices of, okay, all the terminal vertices belong to the same connected component. Uh, so hopefully this is reasonable from the definition. Uh, so Steiner tree K exists in G even only if uh, all the terminals belong to the same connected components. So if G is a disconnected graph and you have terminals spread across multiple connected components, no matter what edges you pick, even if you pick all your edges, you will not be able to connect the terminals, right? So that's, you know, that's, that's true because you do need to have the terminals in a common connected component. In fact, because of this, you can, without loss of generality, assume that the input graph is connected, right? Okay, the second option from whichever question uh, number, I think this was the second question. The second option is that the input instance is equivalent to a reduced instance in which all terminal vertices have the key exactly one. So what we are saying here is we can always convert um, a random Steiner tree by, okay, not random, but an arbitrary Steiner tree instance into another one, which has the property that terminal vertices have degree one, and that this instance is equivalent to the original instance. So let's try to do this by basically saying that we take all of these terminals and add a matching like this. By a matching, I just mean have every terminal vertex. So these terminals may not originally be degree one. So you could have all kinds of complicated structure on the terminal vertices. But let's just, for every terminal, let's give it a degree one friend who is a new vertex in the graph. And now let's say that we are trying to connect these new guys. So these are your original terminals, let's say A, B, C, D. And now I'm just trying to work with A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. And notice that if I manage to connect A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, then whatever I use, well, I'll of course have to use the orange edges because that's the only way to connect these fellows to the rest of the world. And then after that, whatever I do will automatically connect A, B, C, and D, right? So I want to claim that if these edge weights, the new ones, let's say they have an edge weight of one, or you could, I mean, yeah, so the weights are strictly greater than zero. So let's, um, um, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just give these guys weight one, right? And let's say that in the new graph, we are looking for a Steiner tree. So if your target weight in the original graph was some, let's say, K. So you were looking for a Steiner tree whose total weight was at most K. Then in G prime, I want to have a target weight of K plus the size of K, which is the total number of terminal vertices, because I basically introduce these many edges, which I'm forced to use in any solution in G prime because these are leaves. The only way to connect the leaves is to pick up their degree one friends. And then you try to connect their degree one friends further. 
right? So the cost of connecting these new links, the new terminals, to their degree one neighbors is already size of k. So we have to introduce that much extra budget in the new instance. And then the rest of it we solve um, as we would solve the original Steiner problem. So essentially, all the terminal vertices here um, do have degree one, and this, um, uh, you know, this instance would have the property. Uh, so it has the property demanded by the question and is equivalent to the original instance by this relationship. You just have to ramp up the budget a little bit. Of course, if some terminal vertex is already degree one, you don't have to do this. You don't have to create a new degree one neighbor. I'm just adding all of them for simplicity. Um, but yeah, essentially the idea is that you can convert all the terminals to vertices of degree one without losing anything. So I do know if that explanation makes sense, but let me know if you want me to repeat anything or try explaining it again. Mm. I mean, I got this k plus um, size of k, but size of k. Yeah, but I didn't quite get how it relates to the second option. Okay, so what the second option is saying is that, um, okay, so you have an instance of Steiner tree. What is what is an instance of Steiner tree? It's a graph G, a weight function on the edges, and let's say a target weight, which I'm going to call K, and a set of terminals, which I'm going to call capital K. So maybe this is a little confusing. Let me call the target weight P. Right. So what is a yes instance or a good instance? So this is a decision problem. So I will say that a yes instance of this is if there exists a subgraph, H of G such that when K is a subset of V of H, so the subgraph contains all the terminals, uh, H is connected, and the total weight of all the edges in H is at most this target. Okay, so because it's a target, let me call it P. That makes it easy to remember, right? So this is an instance. This is an original instance of Steiner tree. And what I want to say is that it's possible to design an equivalent instance of Steiner tree. Where, so it's just like we did with, whether we did it with flows or with the uh, weak on NP completeness. We were basically designing reductions to create equivalent instances, right? So previously we were saying, okay, an instance of one problem which reduces to an instance of another problem. Here we are basically reducing this instance to an instance of the same problem. So we are reducing Steiner tree to Steiner tree, which may sound funny because if you want to reduce a problem to itself, then you don't have to make any changes, right? You can just return the same instance. But now I want to say Steiner tree with the additional promise that every terminal is a degree one vertex. So is the original Steiner tree question basically equivalent to the Steiner tree problem restricted to graphs where terminals have degree one? Okay. This is sort of like saying, well, I mean, um, does vertex cover reduce to vertex cover on cubic graphs? So cubic would mean every vertex has degree at most three. So I'm saying, well, if I know how to solve vertex cover on this seemingly simpler setting where all vertices have degree at most three, then I can use that algorithm to solve the original vertex cover where there's no restriction on the degree of the vertices. So similarly here, I'm saying, can I reduce the, basically the universe of Steiner tree problems and restrict my attention only on those instances where terminals have degree one because that potentially simplifies my life a bit. So can I do that? Can I basically um, can I basically ensure via a reduction that all my terminals have degree one? That, that is what the question was trying to get at. 
Um, so let me know if that's clear. And the reduction is what I described. Basically, you take an arbitrary instance of sinus 3, where it may not be true that terminals have degree 1 in the graph. And what we do is we add a degree 1 neighbor, a fresh vertex. And we treat these fresh vertices as the new set of terminals. And, um, and we basically say that that's your that's new instance and, and it, has this, um, it has this desired property. So, um, OK, got it. So we are allowed to change or add? Change the graph? Yeah. The yeah. Okay. yeah, so that I think is in the nature of reductions that if you want to achieve something, you will have to morph and you know tweak the instance itself. Uh, but you want to do it without damaging um, the nature of the instance. So you want to say that if it was originally a yes instance, then this modified instance where you may have added removed edges or vertices, that's also a yes instance. And if you started with a no instance, then this modified instance is a no instance. So yeah, you are typically, if you want these additional structural guarantees and you want to say that, well, I can reduce this problem to an instance of the same problem, but with additional properties, then I can do it in this way. So it's just like your normal reductions as we were doing with flow, et cetera. It's just that now it's even a little simpler because you're still working with the same problem, but now you're modifications are to guarantee a certain structural property. So, um, so, and you can also formally prove this, what we just argued, the equivalence of it, like you take your graphs and you take your terminals and you add these edges and then you redefine your terminals to be like this new set of vertices, that's your new terminal set and this is your new graph. You can actually argue that this new graph G prime with essentially the same weight function as the original, but extended to be weight one on the new edges and a new target of t plus size of k and this new set of terminals k prime, you can argue that these instances are basically equivalent. So if you have a synergy in G, you can basically take the same synergy and add these new green edges and that will be a new Steiner tree of the desired cost for G prime. And similarly, if you have a Steiner tree in G prime, you can basically delete the green edges and you would have lost the weight of size of K. And the remaining Steiner tree therefore must have a weight of size at most T and it physically connects the original terminals. So hopefully the equivalence of these two instances is clear. I think it's something that you all would have come up with. Maybe the phrasing was a little more elaborate. So that's, I think, a little bit of feedback for me as well. Uh, but hopefully now with this discussion, it's clear. But let me know if it isn't and if I should go over anything again. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. OK, so now let me just look at what was the, what was the third and fourth options. Um, so we said we will try to define a DP table sort of a thing. Uh, so it's a structural DP again. So you have a subset of terminals. So now I'm just trying to focus on capturing the solution on a subset. So B is a subset of K. And uh, for some B outside the set of terminals, so I'm trying to connect everything in K. But for now, for the DP, I'm focusing on the subset B. And my DP table is saying, let's look at T of D comma P. And this is the weight of a minimum Steiner T for um, D union B. Right? So hopefully this is, um, uh, this is reasonable or is a definition. And I think, oops, okay, so low battery here as well, but okay. So this option said that um, um, T of the singleton terminal T and V equals zero as the terminal is a, um, is a singleton vertex. So again, 
um, I don't know, was this option confusing? Uh, uh, yeah. The point is that, yeah, sorry, Arya. Oh, oops, sorry, your audio is breaking just a bit. Um, but also feel free to post in the chat if that's easier. Uh, yeah, am I audible now, ma'am? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're audible now, yes. Yeah, so what I was saying was, yeah, this uh, this C option was a bit confusing as well uh, because okay. uh, like terminal T, if it is a singleton vertex, uh, so basically my Steiner, like the number of terminals that I have is only one, right? In that case. Correct. Correct. So shouldn't it yes. have like uh, the weight as zero because uh, it doesn't require okay, any edges so... to connect to itself, right? Correct. Which is what so the I think the... Are, so. right. Except that here we are redefining our terminal set. So if you look at the definition, it's saying the weight of a standard tree for the set D union V in G, so D union V is, so you're trying to connect D and you're trying to connect it using V. So I'm temporarily thinking of V also as a terminal so that I can make sure that my standard tree includes V. Basically that is, um, that is the semantics of this DP table. So if I'm insisting on the singleton terminal T to be connected with V, then well, the the way to do that would be, well, if there's either an edge or basically you look at the, okay, I think in general, you have to look at the shortest path between V and T and uh, that would be the value of this sort of a base case, if you like. So I think the crucial thing here is that it's not just T, you're trying to connect T with V. That's, that's what this semantics is representing. So this T, so this expression T of uh, curly braces T comma V is equal to zero. So that, right. uh, so we've already established that T of D comma V as a minimum possible weight of a Steiner tree for D union V in G, right? So this is as per the question, right? This is the definition of, so we are trying to define a DP table basically, right? So for any subset of terminals and for any vertex which is not a terminal, we are defining P of D comma V as the weight of a Steiner tree that connects everything in V with V. So if, yeah, sorry. Yes. Is it necessary that uh, the V has to be the root node in the tree? Is it necessary that V has to be the root the root node in the tree? Well, I mean, okay. So the Steiner tree is not, not by definition not not necessarily a rooted tree. However, yeah. So basically, we are just looking for some tree that connects all of the terminals, right? However, um, the intuition is kind of what you are getting at. So why are we interested in computing these values? It's because ultimately what I want to do is, I want to sort of guess um, that, well, so let's see. So if I have, my set of terminals k, and there is some solution. I'm not. Um, um, I'm not aware of what the solution looks like, but um, but I sort of want to guess what if the solution contained a vertex v, right? In that case, in in some sense, I'm going to try and capture. Um, 
I'm going to try and capture this information. So this is V, which is, I mean, V through some tree is trying to connect the entire set of terminals. So basically what we are saying is, um, so suppose, okay, so suppose for a subset of terminals, V, let's, so let me try and put it this way. So for every word, every non-terminal vertex, let's, Let's propose that if you look at if you look at the Steiner tree, um, which connects the subset B through a vertex V. So I want to say that there is a subtree of H that contains B and is attached to the rest of the tree through the vertex V. Then basically what I have is um, I want to break this down into so in fact even for the reference for d comma v the way i want to think about this is okay let me write down an expression and you can let me know if it sort of makes sense so i mean I, i'm just a little hesitant to use the word root but i do want to say that you're on the right track with with that idea okay so um so let's see. So I don't remember if this shows up as one of the, or if we had a question or an option around this, but let me put this in any way. So this is, um, I want to go over all the non-terminals as a guess for how I, um, Yeah, for, for how I attach two pieces of B. So let's try basically going over all subsets of D. Um, and I want I want to go over all proper subsets. Okay. And I want to again think about non-terminal purposes. So I want to think of U in B minus K. And so what, what is this, okay, what am I looping over? Let me try and clarify that. So what am I looping over? Um, I'm looping over a guess that I can connect, um, so this is my D prime and this is the rest. This is D minus D prime. So this whole thing is D. So if I can connect D and D prime via U, uh, I mean, sorry, D prime and D minus D prime via U, then in some sense, I can combine these trees to get, um, so if D prime and D minus D prime have two Steiner trees that connect them, and those two Steiner trees overlap at a common vertex U, then is it clear that you have a common Steiner tree that connects everything? Is that reasonable to say? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so in some sense, that is the U that I'm trying to guess. So the point is that we have, um, so if I'm trying to figure out how to connect everything in D, which is some subset of terminals. So just imagine that you're looking at some optimal solution here. Okay. Something like this, right? So in some sense, I can think of this optimal solution as, so remember in whenever we are doing DP or references, we are trying to break up our solution into smaller versions of themselves that we can then hopefully combine using a reasonable recurrence. So if I look at this solution here, for instance, I can think of this solution as being composed as one solution for this subset of terminals and one solution for this subset of terminals here, right? And in some sense, the way those two solutions combine is through this vertex here at the top. So I'm trying to kind of go over all of these possible splits 
and I know that the optimal solution will be captured at one such split. Whatever that optimal solution looks like can be captured at um, at one such split is what I want to see. So, okay, let me write down what I want this thing to be. Maybe you can already guess what I'm going to write here, but I'm going to try and connect. So I am going to go over all possible subsets. I'm going to try and connect um, D prime using U and I'm going to connect D minus D prime also using U. Um, so that will that will capture these the costs of these two Steiner trees. But remember that I'm forcing the inclusion of D in my solution. So basically to account for dragging V into this, um, I am going to also add the distance, the, the distance of the, by distance I mean the length or the weight of the shortest path between U and V. Okay, so let me see if I can, um, yeah, so, so one way to prove this reference would be like to do the usual thing. So, uh, so Arya, U is a single vertex, so we are looping over all the non-terminal vertices and we are trying to connect a non-empty subset of the terminals using a common non-terminal vertex, okay? so. What I want to say is okay. So let's um, let's. Ma'am, but uh, you... I yeah. was thinking that wouldn't it be possible that there is already so consider a case where there is already actually one tree which is already there, and I don't need any right. non-terminal vertices uh, to connect two subsets of that tree itself because it is already a tree in some sense. Why are they terminals? So you in that case can oh, so be you mean, I as well. Okay, so the thing is, I'm going to again assume here without loss of generality that the terminals induce an independent set. Um, that just makes it a little bit cleaner for me to think about this um, this reduction or this this sort of recurrence. And the terminals form an independent set because you can sort of always do this. Uh, but the kind of situation, so I guess your question is, is this DP going to capture the situation um, where we have um, we have a solution sitting inside the terminal set itself because we seem to be insisting on uh, connecting the terminals through non-terminal vertices, right? So the point is that we are going to apply this, yeah, so... So what I'm actually going to do is um, uh, what we what we actually going to do is pre-process the graph first and add these degree one neighbors to the terminals so that we can basically not worry about this as a corner case. Um, this just makes it a little bit easier in terms of writing. Otherwise, you are right. We would have to also account for basically look at the set of terminals if they're already connected look at the minimum spanning tree on the terminals and sometimes it may actually be cheaper to use something outside like this minimum spanning tree on the terminals may actually be very expensive so you may still prefer to get out and use a non-terminal vertex because that may just be cheaper but it's also possible that the minimum spanning tree on the terminals is actually the best you can do so if you want to be comprehensive then uh, with this reference, then I think you can uh, you can basically add an extra uh, element when you take the minimum. So you do the solution that you get from the DP and just compare it once with the, uh, like the only solution which does not use any non-terminal vertices at all would be the minimum spanning tree on the graph induced by the terminal. So you can do one sort of sanity check at the end. But it turns out that it won't be necessary because you can always assume that all terminals are degree one vertices and you're basically going inside to build up the standard key. Okay. Okay, great. So um so okay, this is the this is the reference that, that I wanted to get at. In fact, again, now see that it is a reference that, that we did come to in the in the next question. 
Uh, but before that, maybe I kind of jumped ahead a bit. So, um, so Arya, if the semantics of the uh, of the DP table T V comma V are clear, would you agree that this singleton vertex, the Steiner tree would have to connect to V, and that's why you need to take the shortest path? Is that is that okay for now? Sure. Ma'am, that is, I mean, I, I thought about it again, but I'm not getting this part, which is that, so uh, I just want to decode this uh, terminology that you're using. So, I mean, the representation. So you have T and inside curly braces, a small T and V, right? So this small T basically denotes uh, a single terminal vertex, right? Or it denotes yes, it more denotes... than... No, no, it denotes a subset of terminals which has size one. So it's just a singleton set. Yeah, a singleton subset of terminals. Yes. Yeah. So basically, this is one of the ter terminals, and it is. I mean, that's this is only one terminal vertex, and this is a subset of the k terminals that we have, right? Now, uh, the uh, the idea of uh, Okay, so if I look at the question, so the second half of the question for D is a subset of K and V belongs to VG minus K. So for basically uh, define TDV as the minimum possible weight of a Steiner tree for D union V in G. Uh, right. Now my question is that, uh, I mean, again, I'm getting kind of lost in the, even in the DP you were saying, right? Ki, uh, if we don't think uh, like, U, uh, so in this case, U is the V, right? Because VG minus K is, uh, uh, V belongs to VG minus K, right? So from the DP right. case, what we were using as U, over here it is V. And what I was thinking right. was, it is also possible that V can be phi because, I mean, why would I, uh, so for a subset terminal, uh, subset as T, which has only one single terminal, why would I even go ahead and choose a vertex V to connect it back. I mean, why do I even need it in the first oh. place? Okay, so like I said, let's focus maybe on one question at a time and we'll come back to the DP and try to argue its correctness uh, separately. But what I want to say is that because at least with option, with the third option, what we are saying is if you just read out the sentence, it, it says the minimum possible weight of a Steiner tree for D union V. In this case, it would be a minimum possible weight of a Steiner tree for T and V put together. That's the semantics of this capital T, right? So what this is trying to do is that it's trying to ask for the minimum cost of connecting the terminal T with the vertex V, which is a non-terminal vertex. Why we want to do this is a separate story, but we cannot do this at zero cost because all edges have positive weight. And so if you want to connect two vertices, you would need uh, to actually use a path between these two vertices. So this to say that this is zero cost is not correct. Is that, are you convinced by that locally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense, yeah, okay. Okay, that makes sense because we are explicitly asking that we want to connect T with V, right? So that's why, yeah, but, uh, that's why this yeah. is not. I think like one of the things I got, so when we say Steiner, so in, in essentiality for temper, uh, in a temporary fashion, we are kind of considering V as a terminal, right? For it in a temporary fashion, because yes. otherwise yes. there is right. no meaning of a Steiner tree, right? Because... Correct. Uh, because Correct. So we are, we are talking about, terminals. yeah. Correct. No, so I mean, yeah, the tree for a singleton terminal would kind of be trivial. There's nothing to do. So in this case, in any case, what the DP is trying to do is it's, it's creating this temporary terminal set, which is a subset of the original terminal set combined with one non-terminal vertex. That's what it's, that's what it's trying to do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's why uh, so that's why the third option stands incorrect in its in its current form. Now the fourth option uh, is that you have at least uh, two terminals in the subset that you're considering, and uh, we want to say that. Um, okay, so what are we considering? Um, T one is. Oops, okay. 
so we have d prime is a split subset of d right and uh, this is something that i was alluding to before as well so this is d let's say this is d prime okay and uh, so d prime is a strict subset and so therefore d minus d prime so both of these sets are basically non empty right um yeah so what we are saying is we have one tree t1 which is a steiner tree for things in d prime and then we have another tree d2 which is another steiner tree for d minus d prime but in both cases it's d prime union b and d minus d prime union b so basically both of these steiner trees happen to contain the vertex b right now we want to say or we want to claim that if we take the union of these two trees then we get a connected subgraph that contains all of b and um, hopefully this is clear because if i wanted to connect any pair of vertices in d prime i can use the tree t1 to do that if i want to connect any pair of vertices in d minus d prime i can use the tree t2 to do that but now if i want to connect something in d prime with d minus d prime then i know that i have a path from d prime to b because t1 connects everything in d prime and b and i also know that there is a path from the vertex in d minus d prime also to b for the same reason so these two paths can basically be glued at b to get a path that connects this pair of vertices and of course b is connected to everything so uh, it's connected to everything in d prime and b minus d prime just by definition so it's connected to everything in b so hopefully it's reasonable that uh, the claim that we are making here is reasonable that p1 union p2 is a connected subgraph that contains p so are you raise your hand so yeah is anybody going to ask if this makes sense yeah ma'am so my doubt is that we are not claiming in this case that um, t1 uh, and t2 and v together form the minimum weight steiner tree right i mean we know that v to t2 and v to t1 have the minimum weights uh, with respect to v right so v is uh, just an arbitrary vertex which is outside the kernel set right uh, sorry terminal set Correct. so right. but v right. itself by its choice is random in nature so there could be a better v as well if i compare it with another v which maybe connects both of them individually but it might have lesser weights right so that is also possible yeah if you take a yeah so if you take a different v the story may be different but one question worth thinking about and i'll not get into it now in the interest of time because maybe we want to talk about the other stuff but you could ask yourself is t1 union t2 the best you can do for the union v where this v is the same v as the v that we considered for t1 and t2 if it's a different v of course all bits are off but if you fix a v then you know if i'm comparing so i'm trying to think about the optimal solution for d union v and i give you two optimal solutions for d prime and d minus d prime with v and this v is the same throughout then will this combination give you the optimal so here in this option we are not claiming it we are making a weaker claim and hopefully the correctness of the weaker claim is clear now the stronger claim would be that t1 union t2 is the best you can hope for for d union v where this v is the same v as the v that was being mentioned for t prime and t minus v prime you can ask yourself is that optimal and i'll leave that as something uh, to think about yeah okay ma'am got it okay yeah it's a valid point if the b changes then you can probably do a better job of connecting b you don't have to necessarily go through this particular b so that's that's uh, valid point. so an, a small like uh, this thing is it uh, somehow uh, so in the kruskal and primsel i think they talk about a separator lemma wherein they try to join it with the minimum weight vertex right uh, of the vertices mm -hmm. that are covered versus not covered so is it is it something related to that or is this completely different from that right so yeah i mean i would say that this is uh, this is slightly different in the sense that yes yeah, so in prim and kruskal i think they try to grow this 
sort of region of yeah i mean uh, okay so, so one way to do it would be to start somewhere and try to keep optimally growing a connected region so the next vertex that you bring into the visibility region is done via a greedy optimization over you know you look at all the edges that are going out and uh, you know you basically pick the one that would give you a cheapest connect to the outer world um this one in in some sense is different because first of all what we are doing here is a lot more um in some sense a lot more expensive um uh it is um yeah as you can probably see uh, we are kind of trying to go over all possible subsets of the set of terminals so if the set of terminals is like i don't know if it has n by 4 vertices or something this algorithm is already going to take two days to n over four uh, uh, you know iterations as it were that's the size of the dp table so in some sense something fundamentally different going on here because we are trying to um uh, we we searching a much larger space and we sort of doing it in a carefully exhaustive manner um but i guess some of the broad ideas in terms of you know what it takes to be connected and so on those are those are kind of fundamental but right now i cannot think of a way of directly relating the ideas the main ideas that drive prem and pascal are sort of these greedy choices which are really based on the fact that you know that you have to connect everything anyway so that's uh, that's what drives the correctness of those algorithms whereas here actually since you have done np completeness you can think about why standard trees np complete that's also a cute question to think about i may give you some intuition about the difference between say standard tree and standard tree right so um okay so i think um yeah with that um yeah i'm just going to check it are you good with that answer arya and move on uh ma'am sorry i think i lost my connection but yeah i understood your prim and this thing so yeah okay uh, but right. recently okay. what you asked i couldn't hear so uh Oh, okay the last thing i said was try to think about why standard trees and be complete that might give you some intuition for the differences or the contrasts between standard trees and standard trees okay yeah okay okay yes ma'am yeah okay. Okay. okay so um all right so here i think uh, the last two questions are basically asking if this was your dp table then where is your answer and um so what we are saying is the standard tree without loss of generality actually contains a non terminal vertex so i know arya raised this point about well what if the standard tree is completely sitting among the terminals and the terminals form a connected subgraph and i think that is a valid edge case uh which okay so the thing is that one is what we are implicitly doing is we are reducing this graph so that you have terminal vertices having the guarantee of being degree 1 so the terminals induce an independent set so we do that precisely so that we don't have to worry about certain edge cases um it also simplifies matters in in other ways so um so but i would say that that's probably a valid reason to feel that the last option may be incorrect because it doesn't account for the possibility that the whole solution is sitting inside the terminal set um so we'll look into a possible reevaluation especially if it's possible to just maybe throw away the last option if that's not possible we'll look into what we can do but by now hopefully everyone agrees that if you do the simplification where the terminals induce an independent set then you know that you have to pick at least one non terminal vertex and what this minimum is doing in the last option is saying let's let's try all of them and semantically t of k comma v is giving us the best way to connect k using the vertex v and we know that some of the other vertex will have to be used so let's just try all of them and take the best among those options so does that make sense and uh, it's yes ma'am same reason why the yeah and the previous option is not correct for exactly the same reason that you need to the second but uh, so this is number. like Uh, so is this the, the is this a fact that uh, there cannot be a steiner tree without using one non terminal vertex 
Okay, if you perform the reduction, then yes. Uh, so if you do this, right, which we did a few minutes ago, so you reduce the original problem to an equivalent one where all the terminals have degree one, then you do need to use non-terminal vertices because there are no edges between the terminals, right? Yeah, I'm. but in the original problem, uh, there is no such uh, restriction, right? So these options, are they framed with no. respect to the reduction or the original problem? Right. So implicitly, I think I had a simplified instance in mind. And I think there was some language which indicated that we are going to work with a simplified instance. But I don't see that on the, on the portal. So I think you could be... Um, you could be working with the original instance and that would be totally valid. I don't expect you to, from the current description, I don't expect you to be working with the reduced instance. So yeah, you can easily come up with a situation where, you know, you can come up with small examples where to connect the terminals, you don't need to go out of the terminal set. They're connected and the MST on the terminals is cheaper than anything you can do outside. So in that sense, this this minimum in the last option will not capture that option. So what you're saying is, yeah, it's not a fact that you'll always need a non-terminal vertex for an arbitrary Steiner tree instance. And if that's what you were working with, then we should definitely reevaluate your answer because you would be correct with respect to, um, you know, arbitrary instances of Steiner tree. But just for the sake of understanding, if you have performed the reduction that is suggested in option B then option f is correct uh yeah yes ma'am uh then though okay. it has to be correct in some way right because uh, no yeah. but even then let's say um i mean again an h case would still appear right where i mean i let's say i have have only one terminal and it is already degree one as a sink the graph itself has one vertex let's say so the steiner right. tree would okay. also have one vertex so even okay, then that's a really mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's fair that's a I mean, really it's a pathological example case. but <laughs> yeah it, it is yeah, i mean true. it's an edge case okay. right so yeah yeah no that's true i think typically for problems like steiner tree you would typically implicitly assume that you have at least two terminals because otherwise the problem is not interesting and in fact if you have exactly two terminals also um, in some sense, that would be a polynomial time situation because basically you're looking for a shortest path. So um, so one and two terminals for Steiner tree uh, would be basically not that exciting. So maybe going forward, I'll just make it explicit that we are looking at terminals like um, that we have at least two or in fact, even at least three terminals because that's, that's, when, the, that's when the problem is interesting. Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, while I was uh, searching on the internet for this as in resources, so some uh, at quite some places I uh, uh, I saw that they are do using, so they are uh, taking up one terminal and then they are applying Dijkstra and that they say, they claim that it is an approximation algorithm. Okay. So for okay. solving yeah. so time. Correct. So I think it's a fairly intuitive thing to do would be to try and uh, try and connect the terminals um, in some sense using the shortest paths that exist between them. Um, and there are different um, ways that you can try to do that. And certainly, I mean, to begin with, so for instance, if you have three terminals, you might say that you just look at, so you have three of them pairwise. And so you can try to connect A to B and B to C via shortest paths or try the other combinations and take the best of them. That would definitely work out in polynomial time. Um, but the question is, is it, um, is it optimal? So again, I think it's very instructive to play around with these examples to sort of develop your own uh, kind of intuition for what's happening. Um, so I'll, I'll let you think about that a little bit, but the approximation, um, in fact, um, yeah, so, so so the approximation ideas are also very interesting here, but I think this assignment focused more on the sort of the exact algorithms. So we are just trying to do a DP that is guaranteed to give you the uh, the optimal answer once it's completely done. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah. think I made a mistake because when I made a search, everyone was posing that algorithm and I thought that is how you solve a Steiner tree. 
because and then oh, i didn't, okay. it didn't oh, even okay. cross my mind that it is actually an np complete problem i thought we'll just run dijkstra oh, and stuff and uh, okay. uh, sorry not dijkstra the yeah. prince algorithm and everything mm-hmm. and then we just get some values and stuff so right uh, right yeah so no fair enough i think uh, that's uh, i think it's easy to imagine like i said i think when i encountered this for the first time as well i was like if anything this should be easier than planning tree because it's less work to do you only have to connect some subsets so if we can do spanning tree then this should also be easy and um, yeah i mean one of the things of course is that if um, the terminal set itself is connected then you could try to find a spanning tree among the terminals but first of all the terminals will not be connected secondly even if they are the spanning tree on the terminals may not be the best you can hope for so you run into those issues and um, yeah in general also i think it's once you start playing around with ideas for algorithms and small examples and maybe start thinking about reductions is when i think the contrasts start becoming uh, clearer so so i definitely find it very relatable that you thought for some time that sinusoidal tree must be easy i mean i i also i think that's the first intuition that came to me as well but i think you realize over time that it's actually hard so um so yeah, yeah i don't uh, know if when the uh, when we yeah. lose math ma'am then uh, everything becomes very clear so okay <laughs> all right so no, i'm sorry about that i think this was probably um, i think that cross all the assignments for me personally also i think this was uh, one of the more ambitious problems that i was designing and um, i think to be fair i should have probably talked about steiner trees it's not completely this algorithm um the one that i really wanted to talk about was the one based on inclusion exclusion and because that was in my mind and in fact there is some material around that which is unfortunately just um um uh, yeah not available to you folks right now in its present form but if you had seen that then this would have been a simpler question compared to what was discussed in the lecture so that was my original plan unfortunately it didn't go through for me but um, but i still thought that maybe uh, this is just a good um uh, it's a good exercise in uh, in exact dp programming uh so on, on db over subsets just db over subsets on steroids because you also have like all the structural stuff to worry about but um but anyway so i think let me move on to the next uh, question that that we had i think here um we are not um yeah we are not completely i mean this is more about running time analysis and um i think um what what's going on in the first one is that the minimum is not being taken over non terminals so the connection is to come from non terminals and in any case the main idea is to have like a common connection point between t minus t prime and t prime um and that is kind of the goal um with with how this is broken up so that's not happening in either of those references uh so even if you have uh, so for example in the second reference you have the cost of a steiner tree that connects d prime with u and then you have well t of d minus d prime is not even well defined in some sense um and then so you can go you can connect d prime with u and you can go from u to d you can do that but it's not clear how you connect with the rest which is d minus d prime so that's kind of the missing piece um uh, in in both of these options uh the third option is was intended to be straightforward the idea is that you are computing uh, the if you look at the index of the dp table um this is uh, d comma v where d is all possible subsets of the terminal set so the running time is two days to size of the terminal set with some polynomial overhead i mean the index would be this much and um i think um it's basically that okay so in some sense we are referring to a reference that we haven't specified but it turns out um it okay so i think maybe what i should have said is okay so this is the overall running time so i think i skipped ahead a little bit um 
So let's see, there are two aspects to this. So this, what I've written here is the total dimension of the DP table T. The total number of entries it has is in fact, N minus size of K. That's the total number of non-terminal vertices and two raised to size of K because there's one entry for each subset of terminals, right? So that's the total number of entries in the DP table. But I think this question or this option here is actually referring to the computation of a single entry in the DP table. So for a single entry D comma V, we actually use the reference that I've mentioned before, which is you go over um, D prime strict subset of D, D prime is not empty, and you want a common connected U, and you basically try to connect D prime using U, and you try to connect D minus D prime using U, and then you have the distance between U and D. Right? So this is the reference that I had in mind for the third option. And well, how much time does it take to compute this? So well, that's the number of options we are going over here. So that's roughly two raised to size of D because we're going over all subsets of D. And there's a polynomial overhead just to perform the lookups, the addition, um, and the fact that you also have a polynomial overhead in the choice of U. So that's the polynomial n to the order one and two to the d because that's that's how many computations are involved here. So I guess one valid criticism of this option may be that we haven't specified the reference. I think a part of this was to come up with a reference and the first two options were meant to be hints towards the right reference and, um, and option C was written with respect to this imaginary correct reference. Okay, so um, so Ari, I'll just come to you in a minute, I think, just trying to take a look at, so yeah, so we are almost at 7.30, so yeah, just for those who may not be able to stay back, um, just wanted to say that the remaining options have to do with um, further analysis of, um, you know, how the computations go when you try to sort of combine them. Um, instead of so one way is to say that okay the computation of one dp table entry takes this much time so the overall computation would be the size of the dp table that we mentioned a few moments ago and you could multiply that with the expression that we have here and that would be a valid upper bound on the total computation time but what the last few options are trying to do is trying to do a more careful analysis taking into account the sizes of the subsets that you're working with, uh, so that you get a you get a basically a nicer upper bound compared to just multiplying these two expressions. Okay, all right. So Arya, you had a question. Uh, ma'am, yeah. So my question is that in this recurrence relation, why have you written uh, d u comma v? Because uh, the earlier recurrence that we were looking at, we just said that there would be one common vertex u which is uh, present in both D, D prime and D minus D prime, right? So uh, then Correct. this term of D U comma V shouldn't appear, right? We are not considering any V, right? Well, no, we are trying to still compute. This ex This reference is the reference for computing P of D comma V. So I am insisting, so I'm looking for the optimal symmetry that connects all of D along with V. And what I'm doing is I'm making a guess on a common vertex uh, that basically connects all of D. And in some sense, I'm basically trying to break this up in this fashion. So I'm saying I'm trying to find a vertex U that I can reach from D and that captures all of D prime and D minus D minus D prime. So I would also have to account for um, I would also have to account for this distance. Now, this may well be V itself. So I'm looping over cho all possible choices of U, which are non-terminals. So it's possible that U coincides with V. So V could be that common vertex that ties everything together, but it could also be, um, it could also be a different vertex, which does it. And then I would to actually bring V into the fold uh, the way to do that would be to pick up the pick up the slack and uh, take the distance from U to V. 
Okay, so I will say this that the correctness of this reference requires a proof. It's not um, it's not something that uh, should be like just hand waved through. So one thing that you can see is that this minimum is realizable in the sense that if you give me a d prime and if you give me a u, so that let's say this cost was fifty, this cost was twenty, and this distance is ten, then certainly there is a Steiner tree whose total cost is eighty. And so certainly this upper bound, I think, is reasonably clear. But to say that you actually need this, this direction, it does require looking at a solution and saying that it can always be broken up like this. So that does require a bit of an argument, which I have not made very explicit here. So I, I should say that. But um, but yeah, you do need the B U comma B to account for the fact that U and B may be different vertices, and so you need to connect them as well. Uh, Ma'am, so uh, let's say V is a different vertex from U. So does that mm -hmm. actually mean that U basically connects D and D minus D prime? Sorry, D prime and D minus D prime. Then what is the yeah. What is okay? So, and then there is another vertex V, which is apart from D, D prime, and U, and now it is Correct. connecting to U itself. Uh, so, uh, yes. so essentially, in a way, uh, this uh, set of U and V together kind of partitions D and D prime. Can we say something like that? Because yes, U you by can it, indeed. yeah. Right. So, so in some sense, it feels like U is doing all the job that you need of connecting D. But notice that in this DP table, our job is not just to connect D. It is to connect D along with V. So, um, okay. So, if you remember when we did DP very early on and with some of the simpler examples, I said, let's try to write a simple reference and, you know, see. So, I think it was for longest increase in subsequence or something like that. I said, okay, let's just take a point in the array and let's just talk about the longest increasing subsequence of that subarray. And it turned out that that didn't work. So we had to go back and enrich the DP. So here, for example, you could try to write a simpler DP where you say, okay, let T of D be the cost of the optimal Steiner tree that connects D, right? And then you could say, well, the answer is T of K. This will be the answer. And you can probably say for singletons, the answer is just one. So your base case is also fine. But now when you try to write the recurrence, and again, this is a good exercise, I think. When you try to write the recurrence of D of D, so I want to connect all of D. And I know the cheapest way of connecting D prime. I know the cheapest way of connecting D minus D prime. So I can try to say, okay, T of D equals T of D prime plus T of D minus D prime, and this is a minimum that I take over all D prime, right? I can try to write something like this, but this reference would not quite be correct. So I can sort of say, okay, let me take a min over D prime strict subset, something like this. Uh, but this reference wouldn't quite be correct because I have some tree that connects D prime, I have some tree that connects d minus d prime but these trees may be completely disjoint right so it's not clear that these two trees can actually combine meaningfully to give you a connection for all of d and so this is not comprehensive so if you try to do this db and you fail you realize that okay i need a little more information in my semantics in my db table to be able to actually tie everything together. And that semantics is that glue that is provided by that common vertex. And uh, that is where this revised semantics comes from. It comes from the fact that the natural DP in some sense uh, fails to give you a valid record. So again, I think some of this may require this walking up and down for some time and brooding no, over no, options. I actually but, yeah. thought thought about this but so initially when you were doing the dp so you took only one vertex u right and then way back when we were discussing uh, the first problem itself so that time you wrote a dp which just took the u vertex right so in that case uh, is it uh, 
Uh, yeah, so isn't this like oh, sufficient are you enough? To this? This? Not this, yes, not this. this uh, is... Not, not this. this. Okay. Uh, it was even before uh, the other one, D. And uh, I mean, if you go back the slides, maybe I can tell you what it was. But uh, right now, exactly, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, this one. Uh, so I, again, go back. Um, uh, go front, go front. So, uh, so yeah, this one, this one. Yeah, in the blue, you've written right D D prime. Sorry, T D prime U plus T D minus D prime U plus this thing, right? So, right. Uh, without the so red this is part, exactly the same as. Well, the red no, part but... is actually a part of the recurrence. Um, I was yeah. So this the red part actually completes the recurrence. If you just look at the blue section. Uh, that wouldn't quite be correct because just think about it this way, right? So if somebody gives you, so if you don't have the red part and somebody gives you a tree that connects B prime via U and D minus B prime via U and both of these trees do not contain the vertex V, then you can combine these trees to get a tree of the promised cost, but it would not connect TV union B. So it would not be a valid outcome. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, I think I got where I was going wrong. So, uh, okay, so we have to necessarily include V, right? So, there is no... Yeah, because I... that's in the semantics. So, it's the weight okay, of okay. a minimum symmetry that connects everything in V and V. So, as you said earlier, we are temporarily modifying the terminal set to only look at V and we are also bringing V into the fold. So, we are saying connect all of these values and give me a symmetry for that. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, in the second option, like what does this D minus D prime mean? Uh, because there is no vertex there, right? And that was what uh, yes. kind of encouraged me to assume that U, V, everything can also be phi uh, during the course of the of the assignment itself. But yeah, so now I you were saying that it can't in... be phi. Right? right, so I think this was an intentional typo. I think both of these options are hopefully marked incorrect because the recurrences no, are not is, sensible. B is marked as correct, ma'am. Oh, if B is marked as correct, then it should have been D minus D prime comma G. So this is the correct recurrence, the one that I have on my screen. Um, so I think if... Uh, yeah, so, so option, okay, so I think maybe let's read uh, both of these options with the vertex U in it. I think the intended, um, okay, so in my mind, actually, both A and B as they're given here would not make sense because the T, the second T is not well defined. Um, and sometimes I have DP references in the options that are meant to be wrong simply because we have, they're not well defined and uh, this will be one of those examples so i'm not sure why that's marked as correct it should actually be marked as incorrect and in fact that's the explanation that i have in my notes as well uh, so i'll double check that but just to be sure that we are clear about what the correct reference is the correct reference is the one that you see on the screen right now which is that you have a common vertex u and you use that common vertex u to connect um, d prime d minus d prime and V. And it's also conceivable that um, it's also conceivable that you have uh, uh, U equals V, in which case distance of V comma U would basically be zero. It would be something that, that you don't have to uh, uh, you don't have to worry about basically. So um, yeah, yeah. so enough. hopefully yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then the last three options, uh, last, I mean, D and E option, if we can go through, because I think F option is anyways, like, a, um, if we just get the right. Yeah. yeah. So if we get D right, then we already like F would be just an extension of doing polynomial work on it. Right. So uh, that is fine. But right. if we, if we can just get the D option, why the D option is correct instead of uh, okay. the e, e option. Yes, as opposed to I, the E option. Uh, even yeah. I want to plan So plan. I had marked it as E, but uh, the answer Same, is saying D. Yeah. So I didn't get like, why that is the case. So like, you had marked option E as and it's exact? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, exactly. 
the the inspiration i took was uh, i think one of the uh, nck sets uh, subsets that we do and then uh, there was a reduction okay. analysis that you did right 4 to the n then 3 to the n so i did a similar thing which i felt that there should be exactly that many this thing Okay, so I think uh, this is again probably confusion stemming from uh, the pre-processing questions. So here, um, if we are going to assume, um, yes, so we have, um, Yeah, so I think, yeah, in some sense, you're right. If you just read it as um, as sets uh, which are being chosen. So if you want I-sized subsets of B, um, or rather, if you want I-sized subsets of K, which is the set of terminals, um, then basically for all, um, yeah, so the only thing, um, Yes, yeah, so, so in some sense that counting is correct. You have k size of k choose i many subsets of size exactly i, um, and uh, you have n choices. I don't know if the um, yeah. So I think the only question is, should it have been like in in terms of the exact count? I think v is looping over non terminals. I'm just trying to remember what I had in mind here. So I think. Um, if n is the total number of vertices in the graph, then um, then what we are going over is only those v's which are non-terminal. So it would be k choose i times um, uh, times n minus size of k, basically. So in that sense, this is an upper bound. Um, but let me see if there's anything. Um, anything more to it that I'm missing? Like, are there any other things that we can actually throw away? Um, Yeah, no, I think this is this is just the fact that the exact count would have been at minus size of k. Uh, Ma'am, can you repeat once again what you were saying? Like the exact count would be? Yeah, yeah. So basically, when I was remember when I was loop when I was trying to estimate the size of the DP table here, right? So if you're looking yeah. at um, subsets D of size K uh, or size I only, that would be K choose I. And that part is correct. But uh, V is looping only over not terminals, right? So the exact count would have been N minus size of K, which is smaller than N. So that's why it's n times k to i is an upper bound. The exact count, if you want the exact count, it should have been n minus size of k. Because when you're looking at d union v, right? Okay, so v itself can be at most uh, n minus k. n so... minus k, because we are looking at d union v as indices of this dp table, right? So we are saying. D is a subset of K and V is V minus K. So I think that's that's the only thing. Um, I think, again, it was meant to be a simple thing. I, I don't think I intended it to be confusing. Maybe I should have just added a reminder that D is a subset of K and V is an N minus whatever. Small V is in capital V minus capital K. That would have probably yeah, I served think... as a reminder that yes, the product is N minus size of K. Yeah, okay. I think the right, confusion... Let me look into was... these two questions. I think... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I think overall the vibe I'm getting is uh, maybe you thought of the total number of non-terminal vertices as being n or maybe the notation was not comprehensive. Yeah, because so when the question, the... Uh, n was also not specified, ma'am. Like, what is n? Uh, yes. So okay. it's no, not... I stated. think that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, I think I probably I... gave you... Uh, uh, Okay. Hmm. So, uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but like the, the, I think the reason I got it wrong was because I took V as any kind of, uh, edge, uh, vertex, right? So I didn't restrict it to G minus K. So I think that is where this thing came off probably. Yeah. 
I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, hmm. yeah. Sorry, Sharon. Yes, ma'am. Even I have the same issue. I just it, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, completely so we, went down. Yeah, so I think V was looping over non-terminal only was given at the start of the previous question. So I should not expect you to carry over that information. I should have at least uh, perhaps added a reminder of that. The, the problem is I think when I'm framing the question, the full context is there in my mind. But um, uh, but but I think it's uh, it's important to make it more explicit. So I think what I'm sensing is that perhaps uh, both of these questions became a, I mean, it's already a slightly challenging setting, but I think it became a little more challenging than I intended it to be because of some of these, um, some of the lack of context in, in some of the questions, which was uh, slightly unfortunate on, on my part. Um, so I think, um, I think I'm good with um, looking into a reevaluation for, for both of these problems, because like I said, uh, it was harder than, than I intended it to be anyways. So I'll look into that and share an update with all of you soon. Um, but again, just, um, okay, so I'm looking at the time here and based on that, maybe we could look into wrapping up this discussion. I think we have looked at the standard three problem. One thing that I haven't done, so a few exercises if you are intrigued by this problem, one is to think about why it's hard. The other is to think about why this reference is correct. Like I said, one direction should be clear that whatever is promised by the right-hand side is achievable, uh, meaning that if the right-hand side turns out to be 100, then you can certainly connect D and V with cost 100. But you cannot do any better than 100. That requires an argument. So do think about that when you have a chance. And um, I will look into a reevaluation of this question. Um, I don't know if there were any quick questions from any of the other DCAP assignments. I'm happy to discuss that now. I'm also happy to do an additional revision session, but I realize that you probably have a deadline coming up tonight. So I'm, I'm also happy to stay for some more time if you had any clarifications on the remaining, on the remaining assignments. Uh, Ma'am, like uh, if there is some time uh, for the last question also, like, I didn't get why the C option is correct. So, uh, if we can discuss uh, The last that. question in which one? The same assignment, branching for maximal independent set. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the question. You saying if V and W are adjacent vertices such that the closed neighborhood of V is contained in the closed neighborhood of W, then the size of the maximum independent set of G is the same as the maximum independent set of G minus W. And you're saying why is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that, I thought that doesn't it okay. effectively mean that we completely uh, to choose only one branch of the tree. So when we did this branching in the lectures itself, so we said that we mm -hmm. will either take V or uh, not of V. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, either take V and discard the neighborhood of V. Otherwise, we don't take V and then we are free to choose any one of the neighbors, which is the first, uh, the second option, right? So, which is true. But the coming to the C option, uh, the, if there is, right. so W is then technically a part of the neighborhood of V, but then doesn't that mean that uh, I can basically just say that G minus W is also equivalent? So I didn't get that part. Like... Yeah, so let's look at what the question is saying. So this is V and we we say the neighborhood of V. And so this is, um, this is one part of the graph. And what we are saying is the close neighborhood of W is totally sitting inside here. And maybe W and V are neighbors, maybe they're not. Okay. Um, uh, either way, I mean, uh, the uh, premise of this question of, would apply. Ma'am, neighborhood of V is sitting inside W. Okay, sorry. Then it's the other way. So, thanks. Okay. So, the neighborhood of the close neighborhood of V is sitting completely inside the close neighborhood of W. Now, we are saying that um, if you look at the maximum independent set, of G. The claim is that the maximum independent set of G is the same as the maximum independent set of G minus W. 
so um so of course one direction in this is clear in the sense that uh, from like maximum independent set of a supergraph is always at least the maximum independent set of a subgraph so whatever independent set you have here would also be independent in g so we really want to say uh, we really want to focus on the other direction but um, okay let's see so suppose uh, so intuitively can you like I said, this is clear. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, yeah. The greater than equal to is clear. Yeah. Okay. So can it be strictly greater than? So can you give me an independent set in um, G, which is strictly greater than the independent set in G minus W? So for that to happen, um. So for that to happen, I think uh, you would have to include uh, W, right? Ma'am, uh, so I came up with a simple, um, say, uh, maybe if you, could, okay. uh, All right. if you could draw. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, what do you want me to draw? A diamond kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah, so one, like one side is V, one side is W. Maybe add one more somewhere in between. <laughs> so these are the common neighborhoods. And maybe W has one less. Uh, no, W has one more and V has one less. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, it is clearly greater. Right, but in this case, is the close neighborhood of V containing no, the v close and neighborhood of w, v? and W have to be adjacent to each other as well, right? Uh, in this case, well, are I they don't know about adjacent. No, in the I question, they are saying then... that it is if V and W are adjacent vertices. So they are asking you to consider right, okay. V and W. Oh, okay, okay. Correct. Okay. I missed yeah. the adjacent but, part. So I see. Right, but what I was going to say is that this is the close neighborhood of V, and this is the close neighborhood of W, and the close neighborhood of V is not contained in the close neighborhood of W. That's what I was going to say. So the close neighborhood is basically the neighborhood along with the vertex itself. So I think you were looking at the containment of the open neighborhood, basically. So that's I think that's that's also part of the whatever uh, concern. Um, but yeah, okay. So so I think um, just coming back to this, notice that if you want the independent set in G to be strictly bigger than the independent set of G minus W, then you have to. So let me also add this edge to be clear. You have to contain W because if you don't contain W, then basically it's the this. The set you are considering is an independent set in both G and G minus W, so it cannot be cannot be strictly bigger, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, so you have a set that is um, uh, that you have an independent set that contains W, but <coughs> excuse me, if it contains W, automatically don't contain any of this, right? Yes, ma'am. And you have some, uh, you have some vertices here, okay. But now I can go to G minus W. I can go to that graph, and I can safely add V to this independent set, right? Because notice that V is not adjacent to any of these other orange vertices, because all of the neighbors of V are sitting here in this in this highlighted region. Yes. Right. So if you give me an independent set which is supposedly bigger in W, uh, in G, I know that that independent set must contain W, but because it contains W, it cannot contain any of the neighbors. So I go to G minus W, I look at the rest of the independent set. So suppose you gave me an independent set of size 100, right? So in G minus W, I have 99 vertices and I don't have W, but this independent set did not pick V because in the original graph it picked W and so because these fellows are adjacent and that's again clear that they're adjacent because 
uh, first of all, it's explicitly given as an assumption, but also if V is sitting inside the neighborhood of W, then of course V is a neighbor of W. But anyway, so because W is picked, V was not picked, which means V is up for grabs. So I can include V in my independent set in G minus W. And I claim that it will not conflict with anything because suppose V was adjacent to one of these orange vertices, that would be a violation of the assumption that all of these neighbors are sitting inside the neighborhood of that uh, These neighbors are sitting inside the neighborhood of V, right? Uh, the last statement that you said. So that would... the, yeah. You, these neighbors are sitting inside the neighborhood of W because that's the definite that's the assumption, right? Yeah, so all these orange points are basically your neighbors which are not uh so so you can choose all of these points, them, right? Because they are not in the neighborhood can, of V, but yeah, they are in the neighborhood of W. Yeah, so yeah, I exactly. can choose them. Exactly. Exactly. So basically what I'm saying is if you give me an independent set in G. I can give you an independent set of the exact same size in G minus W. So you cannot okay. give me something that is strictly bigger than G. Okay, so uh, so initially in the lectures when we saw this idea of uh, maximum independent set and the various algorithms, so over there we made a recursion tree, right? Where we said we uh, either we pick V or we don't pick V, in which case either we do G minus V or G minus neighborhood of V. And then we went on with the analysis and, uh, you know, you asked what okay. would be better to uh, make the tree shorter and all of that stuff. So effectively okay. in that okay. case, if I go back to that recursion tree that this in under this spe special circumstance, then you basically effectively mean that uh, G and minus N of W basically it has no bearing to me. So I just take the branch that is G minus W and follow that path around. If I have such a uh, special scenario, will that yes, be correct? Exactly. If you have, yes, you're absolutely right. If you're in this very special situation where one of the vertices has its entire closed neighborhood sitting inside the other, then in that case, basically you might as well um, uh, you might as well throw out, I mean, um, so you might as well be dealing with the graph G minus W because that's that's equivalent to G. So in this case, you don't, uh, you don't really have to branch. Okay. Okay, ma'am, yeah. Okay. So in uh, some yeah, sense, that. yeah, yeah. So, so I think you're right. I mean, this is what you would call a reduction rule and uh, Again, yeah, I wish um, I wish that you folks had access to the to the final week's material because that's where we do more of exactly what you said just now. You look at these kind of special situations where you have some additional structure, and then in polynomial time you try to take care of things. Uh, you eliminate these structures and you make your instance much simpler. So especially for people who code. Um, these are usually normally what you would do is you do some heuristic thing, but uh, but with the theory that I wanted to talk about, and I will not talk about it much more now given the time. But um, but basically the idea is this: you try to find these special situations where something nice happens, and then you say, okay, we can clean this up. We don't need to do anything expensive. We can simply pre-process the instance a little bit. And uh, the whole idea with kernelization, which was to be the last topic, was to say that can you do this enough that you can prove you can provably guarantee that your instances become smaller in some sense. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, that remains a topic for another day because we couldn't um, uh, we couldn't provide the entirety of the materials in this round of the course. But what I wanted to quickly announce is that although it's not relevant for the exams. Uh, we will be updating the portal with the remaining materials, which we couldn't do because of technical difficulties at my end. And I really hope that if you found this material interesting, if you have some time, please take a look at it uh, whenever you have a chance later. There may not be a lot of motivation because there won't be any uh, sort of graded um, uh, you know, milestones around that material. But uh, I will just hopefully give you a sense of closure and completion. So, so that's hopefully something that will be available in a, in a few days and, and I hope you have a chance to take a look at it and I'm 
sorry it couldn't be done in a more timely fashion but uh, thanks so much for sticking it out in some sense um all the way and like i said um again i'm making it sound like i'm wrapping it up but uh, but if you do have questions from the review assignments that are due today i'm, I'm totally happy to um, you know discuss them i just don't know if it's dinner time for some of you folks and you want to take off then please don't feel obliged but uh, but if you want to stay on and discuss some more i'm happy to Uh, uh, Ma'am, yeah, yeah, Sharon, go ahead, please. Yeah, sorry. I mean, uh, I'm fine uh, with discussing the review assignments as well. Okay, all right. So, do you have something specific that you would like to bring up? I'm, I'm happy to go through. We are discussing uh, the first two, right? It was the last two asked in the hundred as well. Or can yes. we discuss the? Yeah, so if you could just bring up the questions for me, maybe I'll stop sharing the screen here. Uh, maybe if you could just bring up the questions for me, that that would be helpful. Yes. Um, mm. yeah, so while he brings up his questions, uh, yeah. slightly unrelated question, but related to the end term actually. Uh, what yeah. is I mean. Can we expect a week-wise weightage? Uh, um, so I think, uh, OK, so I don't remember how I put it together. But I think it's a little bit heavier on the earlier content because I think that was a little better organized. And I think also slightly, I think, easier because there was some overlap with materials from other courses. Whereas the later material was new, and I, I also felt that maybe uh, it was relatively more challenging and we, yeah that's why we kind of ended up doing more assignments and practice around it but um, but yeah i think okay so let me let me actually look this up and give you a more precise answer i'm happy to um actually make it explicit my, my rough answer is that the weightage is a little more for materials up to actually week five uh, which was the i think basic VP, DD, macroids, and uh, flows. Um, and from week six onwards to the rest, I think has a little less than 50%. So I hope that helps. So it's not a, like a complete week-wise breakdown, but I can also like go back to the, um, I don't have the QPs right in front of me as in the, it's supposed to be like confidential, so I don't remember how to unlock the PDFs, but um, but I can take a look at it a bit later and, and post some additional information that might have for preparation. I was working on some cheat sheets, which may be because I think the notes after a point also became kind of incomplete, but you have all the slides. So I was working on some cheat sheets, which can give you like a quick video of the material, which might help you with the exam. So that's something we will post over in a day or so. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Sharon, do you have the screen yes, that you want to share? Okay. Uh, yeah, ma'am. I'm just my screen. Ma'am. In the third portion of the second review assignment, yes. Could you just? Uh, I said that it, I to begin with I uh, didn't quite wrap my head around reduction very well. I am still a bit fuzzy when it comes to reductions. Okay. So, could you just explain this question a bit? I, okay, sure. I. If I remember correctly, this is a repeated question from a previous assignment. Um, um, okay, so Arya, I see that you have to leave. Did you have anything quick or urgent that you wanted to discuss? I know I owe you an email, which I will send you, but uh, I mean, a reply that I'll send you. But other than that, did you have something super quick or? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, no, nothing. I think, uh, yeah, it was comprehensive. I mean, I had a very shameless request, if at all, that can be accommodated, which is that uh, because this is a relatively tougher course, if there is any kind of opportunity for bonus marks, which is the case for uh, some courses at degree level. So okay. if that is the case, I mean, if you can think about it and if there is something 
uh, over time if you could let us know that would be great sure. because think, yeah. seems like i might end up in a border case uh, so if there is a slight grace if i put it that way then that might just increase my grade by one point hopefully so okay. that is my motivation yeah sure so. now let me find out so to be very honest this is my first experience with offering a course to this platform although i've done npten courses before so i'm also learning about what is and what isn't possible so i'll be sure to talk to the team about this and whatever is doable within the framework and is reasonable and fair will be totally doable yeah uh yeah okay ma'am okay thank you so much yeah. okay. yeah ma'am that would be great yeah yeah, yeah actually i think like another motivation is that on campus a lot of courses have relative grading but here it is like absolute grading right. so whatever right. we get it is completely like written to the stone so some right. sort of leeway yeah, would be helpful yeah okay yeah we'll be sure to take a look at the stats and do whatever we can to make sure that it's uh it's a fair fair assessment yeah thank you ma'am yeah okay thank you ma'am. all right thanks Adan. take care and yes, uh oh so Sharon, let's go over this reduction. I mean, I think what I'll do is uh, just give me a minute to screenshot what I see from your screen and then I'll go back to sharing my screen. Um, so, So I don't know if you can now see my screen. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. All right. So what we are trying to do here is a reduction from, um, we are trying to reduce independent set um, to CNF set, right? So what we, are, what we are doing is we are starting with an instance of independent set, which is a graph G. And um, let's see. So I think we have a we have a target of B. So we want to know if there are B vertices which form an independent set. And from this, we are trying to create a CNF sat instance or a sat formula, which is satisfiable if and only if the graph G has an independent set of size B. So what we are going to do is we are going to create um, a lot of variables. So in particular, we are going to create n times b, where n is the number of vertices and b is the number of uh, vertices we're looking for in the independent set. So we're going to create n times b variables. So i ranges from 1 to b, j ranges from 1 to n. And what this variable is sort of representing is that it's a 1 if the vertex j belongs to my solution and is zero otherwise, right? So if um, if basically the uh, the jth vertex, so let's see, so if vj, so if you assume that the vertices in G are v1 up to vn, and in some sense the vertices in my independent set are u1 to ub, so basically I'm trying to say that if vj is ui, the ith vertex of my independent set is the jth vertex of the graph, that's when I set this variable to one, or that's when I want this variable to be one and it's zero otherwise. So of course we don't know which variables are zero, which variables are one and so on. We want to set up some constraints on these variables, which ensure that whenever you can satisfy the formula, that's when this semantics kind of pops out of it. That's that's kind of what, what we want out of the reduction. So for example, if you fix uh, I, which is the first vertex of the independent set or the second vertex or whatever. So for any fixed I, you want to say that, well, I take on one of the independent set. I mean, so if I fix, say, for example, one, right? So I, if I fix one, so x11, one, one, x12, one, and so on, up to x1n. What this clause is saying, so CN of SAT is fine, right? You know how SAT, um, SAT formulas yes, work. Yes, Right. Yes, ma So if I have, perfect. So if I have this all, this is basically saying you're not allowed to set all of these variables to zero. 
at least one of these variables must be set to true so that I can say that, okay, if one, two is true, that means that I'm picking V2 as the first vertex of my independent set. So I want to make sure that I actually pick enough vertices in my independent set. So I want at least one of these fellows uh, to true. But at the same time, I don't want to be confused. Like I don't want, for example, X12 to be true and also X17 to be true. Then I'm like, okay, should I pick the second vertex or should I pick the seventh vertex as the first vertex of my independent set? I'm going to get confused. So I don't want to allow this. So to not allow this, I'm going to say that... Um, you cannot set both of these to true, which means that if I put this clause in, then um, then what happens is I cannot afford to set both of these variables to true because that will falsify this clause. So if I throw in all of these constraints, not just for one, but for all i, then what I ensure is that for each i, uh, I have exactly one of the vertices that are being triggered to true. But now we still have a problem in the sense that I could have x13 set to true, x25 set to true, x36 set to true, and x45 set to true. This would still satisfy everything. But here we have a problem because I'm saying pick v5 as the second vertex of my independent set and also pick v5 as the fourth vertex of my independent set. That will not be good because then I'm not getting b distinct vertices in my independent set. So I want to prevent this scenario. So I will say that if i is not equal to i prime, then if I'm setting xi to j and xi prime to the same j, then that is not allowed. I don't want to be able to do this, right? So for any pair of indices that are distinct and for any vertex J, I don't want to reuse the vertex more than once in my independent set. So that's what this clause is trying to ensure. And finally, we want to have constraints which say that the things that we actually picked, meaning that if X, I, J is true, which means we picked V, J as the ith vertex, and x i prime j prime is true, which means that we picked j prime for the i prime th vertex. Uh, maybe this is just annoying to say, so I'll say maybe I'll just say x p q, right? So the pth vertex in my independent set is the vertex v q. So if both of these things are true, then it should not be true that v i and v q have an edge between them in the graph, right? So if vi, vq form an edge, so for every such edge, what I'll do is I'll add this clause to prevent these two variables from being set to true together. Okay, so that will ensure that the things I've actually chosen based on what the formula is asking me to do actually form an independent set back in the graph. So while describing the construction, I've also kind of described the proof of why the construction works. So basically, if you have an independent set in G, then you basically look at, so suppose your graph was V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and let's say your independent set was V2 and V5. So then what will you do? You'll basically say, take X1, 2 and set it to true and set x25 and set it to true meaning the first vertex in my independent set is the vertex v2 and the second vertex in my independent set is the vertex v5 so take these two variables and set them to true and set everything else to false and you can verify for yourself that this assignment satisfies all the clauses that we have introduced okay hopefully that's intuitive based on how we describe the clauses but basically, for every slot, we picked exactly one vertex. Across all these slots, we picked distinct vertices. And we picked two vertices that are non-adjacent because I just told you that we do V5 forms an independent set. So if you have an yes instance of the independent set problem, then you have a satisfiable formula. On the other hand, I want to say that if you have a satisfiable formula, meaning you have an assignment that satisfies this formula, then from that assignment, you can actually recover an independent set of size p. And how do you do that? You basically ask yourself, what are the variables that were set to true? So for x1, 
there must be exactly one j which was set to true. So let's say that that j is, I don't know, 7 or something. For x2 also, there must have been exactly one j that was set to true that's different from 7. So let's say that was 4. Then I claim that, well, if this was the case, then V7 and V4 forms an independent set back in the graph. And that's because of the last constraints that we introduced. So maybe that went by a little bit fast, but hopefully the construction is clear and hopefully you have some intuition for why the construction of this SAT formula captures the concept of an independent set in the, in the graph that we started with. Yes, ma'am. I think okay. I have, I understood the, the mo most of it. Okay, uh, great. Another question, uh, not unrelated to this. Uh, mm -hmm. So in reduction, pro when we are making reductions, so mm -hmm. we can either add components to the problem or remove components from it. So adding components logically makes sense. Uh, but when we remove components, does that not... Uh, take away from the problem at hand. So how does, uh, right, so so how not, does I, yeah, so I'm, I'm not completely sure if I understand what we mean by adding and removing components. Usually what happens is that when you're trying to construct a reduction from one problem to another, it's like doing a translation, right? So you are going from one world to a different one and you want to preserve something this the solution should not be lost in translation is how i think oh, about it yeah. right so basically here for example we started in the world of graphs so every instance was an object that looked like a graph and we are traveling to the world of set formulas where every object is you know it's a combination of variables you're doing boolean operations or and etc so you're basically transforming or you're mapping every graph to a SAT formula and you want it to be that every time you start with a graph which does not have an independent set of the desired size somehow magically you produce a formula that's not satisfiable and on the other hand if you start with a graph that does have an independent set of the desired size then the same process the same procedure produces a formula that happens to be satisfiable and if you think about it a bit that's actually exactly what we have done so it's not so much about adding or removing components concretely as it is about really building a structure based on what is given to you which is an instance of the source problem and you're trying to build an instance of the target problem okay yes ma'am yes it is, and, i think uh, so, like, okay so i will say that reductions are generally like not not an easy topic to get the hang of so i would definitely suggest looking at i mean maybe reviewing some of the lectures and also, I think taking a text like Ericsson, which is, I think, the standard reference for this course, and just looking at some more examples of reductions that he has in the NP completeness chapter, and maybe working through some of the exercises. That will that will really help build up build up some intuition once you come up with some reductions of your own. Yes, ma'am. Cool. So, uh, if if we reduce uh, one problem to another problem, yeah. so. Uh, I think there was a question in one of the assignments where you were asked, uh, so if problem A reduces to the to problem B, mm -hmm. and there was also an option that problem B also reduces to problem A. Right. So uh, when we say translate, when we are translating the problem, does doesn't that inherently make it so that we so if we are able to uh, translate a problem A into B or reduce it into right. to a problem B? then there should also be inherently a way to reduce problem B to A as well? Yes, I think that's a great question. Basically, think of this as a map. The reduction is a map. And what you're basically asking is, isn't this map bijective? Like, can't we just invert the map? Oh, and okay, yeah. the point is that it may ne not necessarily be bijective. Like, there may be some very special reductions which are designed to be invertible. But most examples that we see typically, um, so for example, the one that we just saw, it can transform a graph into a formula. But if you try to go from a formula back to a graph, unless the formula has this very special format that this reduction produced, it's not at all clear how you associate a graph with a formula based on the way that you got a formula out of a graph, right? So it's not automatic. That's that would be my answer. 
for the sake of assumption of the question i can't remember the question right now so assume right. a has one more um, one more element which is not even connected okay oh, and right. uh, a minus b uh, if i take that element then uh, the exchange property actually doesn't really make sense because it doesn't affect anything at all and if mm -hmm. i take one of the uh, elements uh, the fourth element maybe which is not in b but connected in this a and if i use that in b then it, it then the exchange property is violated so right. like one one element of a minus b does not violate one element of a minus b violates so then what is the right answer well so as long as you can guarantee that there exists an element that does not violate the property then you're good so basically if you remember when we were showing the graphic matroid being a matroid as well with the spanning tree example mm -hmm. so you'll see that if you have two spanning forests and one of them is you know bigger than the other in terms of the number of edges many edges from the bigger set will be bad for the smaller set as in when you add them you will get cycles so the point is it's a matroid because there exists a good edge at least one of the edges are guaranteed to be good so as long as you can show that you satisfy the exchange right. axiom. you definitely don't need the stronger property that every um, everything can be added that that will in general not be true yeah so one could be good one could be bad and still That's we see that uh, exchange property is not violated because we found one that was good exactly it's not violated as long as you can always find one that is good uh, and and one is enough it doesn't have to be everything yeah. for sure okay. so i think there i went wrong because i considered the other one that was bad oh, and so since it violated the, okay <laughs> yes so you were working with a much stronger version of the exchange axiom which is in general not expected so yeah so going forward as long as you can systematically find one uh, that would be good enough to say that the exchange property holds. Thanks, man. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay, so, um, all right, so I think we, uh, we're close to at this point half past eight, so maybe this would be a good place to, um, good place to wrap this discussion up. And uh, like I said, if you, uh, if there are things that, that uh, didn't get covered in this live session, uh, please feel free to tag me when you post on the forums and I'll make sure to be active right up to when you have exams. And um, as and when the remaining material is released, like I said, no stress uh, for actually going through it, but I hope that if you have a chance to go through it and if you have any feedback on it, I'd, I'd look forward to it very much. And in the meantime, thanks so much for your patience as we went through this course. and. Um, yeah, and, and uh, for today also, thanks for staying back all the way. We had a long discussion and it was great fun. It's always amazing catching up with you folks. So, so thanks for making it. Thanks for your time. And let's keep in touch. And good luck with the upcoming exams. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Thanks, folks. Bye and good night for now. Bye-bye. Okay, so maybe we stop the live stream. Uh...